so I'm going to talk about games. So let's go ahead and start by playing one. All you have to do is make the sound of the animal that you see on the screen behind you. Sound okay? All right, very good. <laughs> so the correct sound is. At least that's what the tortoise in my garden always seems to do. You knew these sounds instinctively, right? You've known you've known them since you were two, and they're probably the first sounds your children will learn. Our childhoods revolved around animals. Our toys, our books, our music, our movies—they were all associated with animals. And whether it be a cow or a lion, animals touched our hearts. But as we grew up. As as we grew up, other things started to take our attention, whether it be sitcoms or video games or boyfriends or girlfriends. And along the way, here we are, facing the extinction of our natural world. But there's good news. There's still evidence that wildlife captures our imagination. Movies like Zootopia and Jungle Book had a hundred million viewers each. Eight hundred million people last year visited zoos. And who doesn't like a video of a sneezing panda bear on YouTube? We're fascinated by wildlife and animals, but with so much competing for our time, we can only pay attention in short bursts, and short bursts don't have lasting benefits. My personal love affair with wildlife started in Chicago, of all places. I grew up in a woody suburb where foxes and raccoons and deer would fascinate my sister and I every day. And I never outgrew that. It actually got to the point where I started spending all my holiday and all my salary seeking out personal experiences with grizzly bears, or chimpanzees, or penguins. But it got to a point where it all started to feel very selfish. These experiences were only for me, and animals were still dying. I didn't want to spend another 20 years sitting behind a desk as an IT consultant and taking these great vacations. So I quit my perfectly good job and decided to get into wildlife conservation. One of the first things I learned was that there's two ways that we currently use primarily to engage an audience with wildlife. The first is traditional fundraising, and the second is ecotourism. And both of these only reach a limited audience: either the already converted, or the small percentage that can afford an experience like this. And meanwhile, there's people on the ground fighting tooth and nail to save a pangolin, or save a bonobo, or save a southern right whale. Conservationists are fighting really hard, but let's face it: they're behind, they're not catching up, and another World Elephant Day isn't going to turn the tide. If you're behind, you can't keep playing defense; you have to switch to offense. And offense, in this case. Means aggressively competing for your attention, based on what your life looks like. It means finding ways for you to want wildlife in your life, not just telling you that you have no other choice. The sectors that are the most successful are the ones that have people's attention every day. We need the same number of people to pay attention to wildlife as pay attention to TV or politics or sports. So I want to ask you, what would it take? For you to every morning, first thing, reach for your mobile phone to find out what's going on with elephants and anteaters. Because if we can figure out the incentive to make that happen, then maybe those elephants and anteaters will compete with Game of Thrones and Lionel Messi and Donald Trump as topics at dinner time. This is what's necessary for wildlife conservation to take its rightful place at the table as one of the most important things in our life. We have an idea that's combining three ingredients that we think could make this happen. First, is individual stories, continuous news about the deaths of anonymous elephants thousands of miles away are sad, but they're too abstract. It's individual stories, whether they be human or animal, that capture people's attention. Just look at how the world reacted to Cecil, a lion with a dramatic story and a name. Second is a channel 
that already has people's attention: games. Two billion people spend an average of six hours a week playing games. Imagine, or what, what if you could pay attention to the life of Manyara the elephant in Tanzania, but in a more interactive way than another. Than another boring newsletter. What if you could compete against your friends on trying to predict what Manyara might do next? Or what if you could compete against Manyara to see who could take the most steps and get the most fit? What about rather than searching through your home city for a fictional Pokemon, <laughs> you were searching for Manyara? Games have a negative connotation because they can addict people. But what if just a small percentage of those billions could get addicted to wildlife? Lastly, we use real data as the final ingredient. What you're seeing here is the actual movements of Manyara the elephant in Tanzania. And because of technology, there are literally thousands of animals currently transmitting this data. We partner with the organizations that are collecting it to bring these stories to your mobile phone. In the form of games, and we in turn take the revenue from those games and give it back to those organizations. So games that use GPS data to bring the stories of real animals to your mobile phone and let you play along. Could that combination get you addicted to the life of Manyara, or Luko the bear, or Wilson the jaguar? That's what we're going to find out. It's not the only way, and it's by no means a sure success. But there's no time left to play defense. We need to find this and other ways to create 20 million, 40 million, 100 million wildlife addicts. Could you be one of them? We're currently developing these games, and we need your input. So Google Internet of Elephants and let us know what you think. And let's all celebrate the life of these animals, and not just mourn their deaths. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about games. So let's go ahead and start by playing one. All you have to do is make the sound of the animal that you see on the screen behind you. Sound okay? Very good. <laughs> so the correct sound is sss. At least that's what the tortoise in my garden always seems to do. You knew these sounds instinctively, right? You've known you've known them since you were two, and they're probably the first sounds your children will learn. Our childhoods revolved around animals. Our toys, our books, our music, our movies—they were all associated with animals. And whether it be a cow or a lion, animals touched our hearts. But as we grew up, as as we grew up, other things started to take our attention, whether it be sitcoms or video games or boyfriends or girlfriends. And along the way, here we are, facing the extinction of our natural world. But there's good news. There's still evidence that wildlife captures our imagination. Movies like Zootopia and Jungle Book had 100 million viewers each. 800 million people last year visited zoos, and who doesn't like a video of a sneezing panda bear on YouTube? We're fascinated by wildlife and animals, but with so much competing for our time, we can only pay attention in short bursts, and short bursts don't have lasting benefits. My personal love affair with wildlife started in Chicago, of all places. I grew up in a woody suburb, where foxes and raccoons and deer would fascinate my sister and I every day. And I never outgrew that. It actually got to the point where I started spending all my holiday and all my salary seeking out personal experiences with grizzly bears, or chimpanzees, or penguins. But it got to a point where it all started to feel very selfish. These experiences were only for me. And animals were still dying. I didn't want to spend another 20 years sitting behind a desk as an IT consultant, 
and taking these great vacations. So I quit my perfectly good job and decided to get into wildlife conservation. One of the first things I learned was that there's two ways that we currently use primarily to engage an audience with wildlife.